Today we live in a world of cyber physical system. These are physical systems which are fully controlled over the internet. On the consumer side, just like cars or Boston Dynamics robots are good examples of such systems. On the industrial side, power plants can be a good example of such CPS. Security of these systems is even more important than online services. For example, an arc flash in a power system can cause explosions, so a relay must be tripped to shut off power in less than a few milliseconds to prevent such dangerous situation. If the system was controlled via software, a hacker can make a minor tweak, which nobody would notice, and it would increase the latency to a few more milliseconds, which would delay the tripping, leading to a very dangerous situation. Today we have with us Ron Nixon, VP of Global Defense at Polyverse, to talk about CPS and what kind of protections these systems need. Ron, the stage is all yours. First, thank you. And you started off with a really good point about like those minor adjustments. And so one is these systems, you know, um, sometimes you'll hear them called cyber physical systems. You'll call them, you hear them called ICS or SCADA um, uh, or manufacturing control systems. Um, but they are literally everywhere in our lives from the water that comes to your house every day to the power production um, for your electricity. Um, the, the distribution of petroleum uh, and oil so that you can have gas in your car. Um, and then you get into, you know, detailed manufacturing, robotics and manufacturing. So these systems are everywhere. Um, and so in the, and the interesting part about these systems is that these systems are, they have a very long lifespan. So your, your iPhone, your iPad, your, your, or if you're an Android person like me, right? So how long is the lifespan of that device? It might be three, four years, maybe, right? Um, and so these systems, their lifespans are, are decades. Um, you can go back and if you go back and you look at the, the Hoover Dam, for example, right? It was built, what, in the late 30s? Um, or maybe, yeah, I think the late 30s is when it was built. But, but regardless, right, so the, the control systems for that originally were manual control systems, people turning gears and, and lifting, you know, and maybe you had an electric motor that lifted or, or changed something, but, but those were all manually driven. Um, and so those, those, those base pieces are still there, those motors, those gears, those lifters, those, those diode-driven flips and things like that, those are still there. And what's happened over time is that technology has been applied to them as opposed to being integrated with them. Um, some people would like to say it's been integrated, but really they are bolt-on solutions. And so you end up with something that's very different than everywhere else in the cyber in the cyberspace is that you have a you have this very long lifespan that you have to be able to protect. Um, and so and then I would challenge somebody to turn around and take a program you know, that might be loaded on a, on a CD or on a floppy disk, right? And load that and attempt to load it onto your machine today, but not only that, run it on your machine today and see what happens, right? So it's, they're not compatible. So now I'll take that and that's over 10, 15, 20 years. Now you take that and you span that out over 20 or 30, 40 years, um, that backwards compatibility um, is really a, a stressor. So you have dated, so you have dated and antiquated systems you have to build customized interfaces that talk to them. So you're doing a lot of digital to analog conversion. Um, and, and again, these systems are, and a lot of times these systems are very dispersed. Um, if you take the Army Corps of Engineers, for example, um, you know, everybody thinks of them as the guys who build the levees, you know, and down in, in New Orleans, or they build schools in Afghanistan. Well, they're also responsible for 3% of all the power production in the United States. And they're responsible for almost all of the um, uh, um, all of the uh, gates and um, flues for water control. Um, so for salmon ladders and things like that. So they're responsible for all of those things. And so they have a very dispersed environment. I think I think the last time I checked, they have something like six thousand sites spread across the entire country. So now you take that, you take all these varying degrees of technology, and then you take the fact that the operating systems that run them are all customized and hodgepodge and slammed together, um, you really have a cybersecurity nightmare. Um, but you have, but it's a cybersecurity nightmare that you can't replace tomorrow because it's really expensive to, to fix. Um, 
But then also, um, you have systems that can't fail. You can't like, so I live just south of DC. We can't lose power tomorrow. We can't lose water tomorrow. Um, you know, Quantico, which is uh, the south of me, is the, you know, the, the Marine Corps' premier base. They can't lose power. Um, and so, so those types of things all fall into play. They become, they're, they're critical to um, our everyday life. If you look at these systems, most of these systems were designed decades ago and were never designed to be integrated electronically. Also, most of the systems were deployed in fields where they can't maintain connectivity or afford any downtime for updates or upgrades. A good example is a nuclear submarine. Software updates of these deployments is, is cumbersome ordeal, which is not worth time and effort. So when you hear that the system is still run on Windows XP and that Pentagon is paying Microsoft heavily to continue to support XP for these systems, there are genuine reasons. But these systems also lack benefits that come with connectivity, such as centralized management and maintenance. You can very easily add functions, new functionalities, which can make these devices more efficient across the board instead of doing one device at a time. So the next generation of such systems have software and connectivity at their heart, which also opens door for new challenges related to security. And you really hit the, the nail on the head when, when, you, when you put it that way. So um, you're right. So you're talking about systems that were never designed to be integrated um, electronically initially and definitely not with the internet. But that network connectivity allows you to centrally manage things. So if you look at General Electric, for example, right? So, um, or, or you take a power production company. So I'll, I'll use Virginia's example, right? So you've got, um, you've got Novec or you've got Dominion Power. Um, and so any of those companies, they've been able over years, they've been able to basically extend their sensor environment out. So they don't have to have, use as many people. Um, but then and they can basically maintain and look at the entire grid all the time. And then, and then that gains efficiencies, not just in, in the ability to distribute the power, but also the, the ability to troubleshoot it, right? So if a hurricane comes through, if you have an earthquake, then they can quickly identify issues and, and surge manpower resources to help fix those. Or they can, or they can do rolling, or they can facilitate rolling brownouts like California's had to do because their power production is inadequate for the population. But, but all of these things are only enabled because of the introduction of computer technologies, of networking, and then you start getting even to more complex, you're adding machine learning and artificial intelligence to begin to anticipate those things. And so you have these systems that were never designed and thought of, and your security mechanism was pretty easy back in the day because it was personnel driven. If I didn't let somebody into the room, then they couldn't affect the system. And um, so now since, um, since you're network connecting these systems, you're now changing that from, you know, maybe the five or six guys, you know, if you take you, so you look at the Simpsons, right? You've always got Homer Simpson at the nuclear power plant and he's the only one in the room, right? Well, now you're taking that door and you're leaving it open to everybody else in, in the internet. Um, and so that, that, so that the, the requirement to interface with those dated technologies forces a constant analog to digital conversion in lots of places. Um, but then also forces, um, and it also forces a, uh, a lot of customization because I could have General Electric building something, I could have um, Siemens building something, I could have a company from, from Korea, China, India, Germany, you name it, manufacturing inside my environment because I'm working off of, uh, I'm working off of like IEEE standards or I'm working off of some type of other industrial control standard which is, which is universally accepted. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm building them or the software the same way as everybody else. There's not necessarily a standard for the software. And so, um, so that, that, that causes a lot of disparity in the way coding is done, in the way uh, applications and programs are, are written to interface with those. And so you ended up with, not only do you end up with hodgepodge hardware, you also end up with hodgepodge software. Um, and so that really does um, complicate your ability to, um, to do that, to protect. 
Yes, it gets complicated very quickly and security itself is complicated. So is there any way to make security easy for them? So you have some you have some more traditional approaches, right? So you have um, anomal, you know, uh, monitoring for anomalous activity. You've got antivirus um, and other signature based um, services. And then what you're also starting to see is you're you're starting to see a trend towards trying to take away the one to many for the bad guys. And so, and what I mean by that is, so you you, you talked about you only have to be right once. And the way the bad guys do that is, is they, they target an environment where if they either write an exploit or they buy an exploit off of the dark net, um, that exploit allows them uh, to hit more than one system. And so, uh, so if you take it, for example, you're right. So, I mean, how many Windows systems are out there in the world? And people go, well, why are Windows systems always being hacked? Well, the reason Windows systems are always being hacked is because Windows is 70% of the end user market share or better. All right. And so, um, so if you wanted to make an analogy for it, it would be kind of like if you were renting a car and, you know, normally they give you a set of keys and that set of keys opens up one car. Well, now they're going to give you a set of keys and that set of keys is going to open up every car on the lot. And not only can you drive it, you not only can you drive it away, for some reason, that key also allows you to drive all of the cars off of the lot if you really wanted to. <laughs> um, and so um, and so what you're starting to see is you're starting to see a trend uh, towards um, uh, you're starting to see a trend towards individualizing these systems. So even though I want to create a system that all of my engineers can work on. So I need to have some level of standardization from an interface and an operating system. And I still need to be able to write applications to that operating system. So I still need to have some standardization there. You're starting to see a trend towards uh, randomization. And so, um, and, and so there's, a, there's a concept called move, moving target defense. And the, the concept of moving target defense is, is, is I'm going to continue to move my target in some or, or an aspect of my target um, over and over again so that when the bad guy is coming after it, it's not in the same place or it doesn't work the same way that it's supposed to. Um, and so that has a, a dramatic impact on that, that one to many. So if I buy an exploit and I'm working in one of these randomized environments, I might be able to get one of those machines opened up but odds are, um, I'm probably not going to be able to. It's going to force me as a bad guy to go back and do reconnaissance and re-look at my exploit, maybe have to rewrite it. And then if the organization I'm targeting is really on top of their randomization, then there's a very good chance that when I come back into that environment, it's still not going to look the same. And so, and what that does, so that does a couple of things. Is One is... Um, so cyber, whether it's a nation state actor or whether it's a cyber criminal or a hacktivist, um, there are two things that they're concerned about. One is the risk of getting caught. The other is, is do I have the resources to accomplish what I need to do? And so, um, you know, and not everything is like Hollywood where, you know, one hacker can go through and, and blow his way through everything in the environment. Um, or, uh, or be able to, you know, take everything down with a couple of lines of code. It doesn't work that way. Um, and so a lot of times there is a, there's cooperation and there's, and there's resources that are balanced, you know, against even for bad guys, even criminals do resource management. Um, and so if, I, if, I'm, if, if I'm randomizing my environment, I'm increasing the complexity of what they're going to have to do to break into my environment because it's not always looking the same. So they may have to leverage additional resources. That makes it more expensive. And if they have to come in more complex, that increases their risk of getting caught, right? So the, the concept of keep it simple, stupid is very uh, attractive in the cyber world. The more simple I can keep my, I, whether my, it's my attack or my defense, the simpler I can keep it, the more effective it's going to be. And so the randomization, so I'm, I'm going to use Polyverse as an example, but so, but what we do is we, so we scramble things at the binary level. And so that when, um, and we, and we, uh, since we scramble things at the binary level, we're acting as the, and we're translating that between the memory assets in the machine. So when the bad guy writes an exploit for, um, for, let's say it's Ubuntu or CentOS, or it's for an IOT or an, inf an IOT device, so the bad guy has written an exploit to come after that device. And so, but now when he goes to execute his memory-based attack, he's not seeing it. 
it's not working the way it's supposed to. And the machine itself is like, eh, I don't, that's not hitting my memory the way it's supposed to. So I'm not going to allow that function to happen. And so, um, and then you can redo that every 24 hours if you want to. So when the bad guy goes, okay, I'm not working, they've got to go, they're forced to go back to the drawing board. They're forced to redo reconnaissance a little bit. And then when they come back in, that environment has changed. And so that randomization um, is a really um, healthy augment to your more traditional uh, methodologies. I was reading and MIT has done some work in randomization based defenses, which to me sounds similar to the work Polyverse is doing with moving target defense and polymorphing. Can, can, can the same concept of moving target defense and polymorphing be brought to cyber physical systems? One is it, it can be. Um, we, we, have a, we have a customer in the Department of Defense um, who is specifically doing that today. Um, and they're using it to protect um, what would be the equivalent to ICS SCADA systems in, um, in seaborne assets, you know, in a, in a wayborne assets. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, the, the cool, the really neat part about, um, depending on the randomization technology you're using, but um, the really cool part about it is, so like we're backwards compatible all the way back to 1997. So every version of Linux from 1997 forward, we have the ability to protect. And the other thing that that randomization does is it gives you true protection against zero days. Um, because zero days still work the same way. They still work the same way as any other exploit. It just, nobody knows it's there. So that exploit's written, again, to execute in a certain function, in a certain way. And, and since it's dealing with a randomized system, a polyverse system, it's de dealing with a, a randomized system, it doesn't know how to function against it. So even your zero days would fail. Um, so, so yeah, it's, um, it's definitely without a doubt. In fact, it's it's very suited towards that ICS SCADA um, cyber physical systems world. I believe that this model also makes life easier for security teams as they don't have to lose sleep at night worrying about applying a patch that were just released. Because even if there are known or zero day vulnerabilities, their systems are relatively more secure. Yeah, so in this instance, so Polyverse and our randomized technology, depending on the operating system that you're dealing with or the IoT device, we take between 70 and 80% of the attack vectors off the table, right? So you're allowing your cyber guys, your incident handlers and responders, your engineers to deal with that other 30 to 20 to 30% of what's out there. And so that's, that's powerful from a manpower standpoint. But then that ability to not have to worry you know, for, for DOD customers, we say you can patch when the mission allows because I might not be able to take uh, an aviation platform out of the air or I might not be able to move a tank off of a battlefield at the moment so I can patch it when it allows. And so you take the same thing for a water treatment facility. They could actually patch in their normal cycle when they have time set aside to take that chlorification uh, element offline or that generator system offline if I'm doing power production or that nuclear reactor, <laughs> uh, right? And so it allows you that freedom to say, okay, my, my mission allows me this time frame to be able to adapt and I can do that then. And then even for an added level of protection, you could, even during that update period, you could also then add a new polymorphed version or a new randomized version of the system. So again, it's a completely new setup as far as you know, bad guy exploits are concerned. Ron, thank you so much for explaining these complex topics and I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. It was fun.